Michael Kramer is not only a visionary researcher, but he's also a person who has straddled the policy world and, give, and given up a lot of his time and effort in that field. He's one of the persons behind the creation of Diva in the World, an organization you will hear about both from him and later on in the date from me. Uh, he's also the person who's, who, who's been really leading the charge in the creation of the Development Innovations Ventures, or DIV, at USAID, and now the Global DIV. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Michael Kramer. Since 1994, randomized evaluations have transformed development economics. Esther kindly asked me to speak about how randomized evaluations in development first took off, as well as about linking evaluations to the policy process. I'd like to start by saying a little bit about my personal experience. After college, I spent a year teaching secondary school in rural Kenya. Then went to graduate school, got a postdoc. Eventually, I got a job here at MIT. At that point, I could afford a vacation. I went back to Kenya to visit one of my friends there, uh, to visit a set of friends. But one of them, Paul Lepea, had taken a job with ICS, a small NGO. And his, he'd been asked to go find seven schools where they would start their standard child sponsorship program. I mentioned to Paul that if ICS wanted to understand the impact of their program, they could find 14 schools and start the program initially in seven of them, and choose those randomly. And you can see I wasn't really thinking about statistical power there with seven schools. <laughs> Paul said he would check with his boss. I wasn't too optimistic. We finished our vacation. I went back to the US. And then a couple of days later, I got a call. The boss was interested, much to my surprise. I got on a plane, flew back to Kenya, and that started a long-term collaboration with ICS, during which we conducted randomized evaluations of programs in a wide variety of areas, from agriculture to education. Undergraduates like Ted Miguel, now a professor at UC Berkeley, worked on the, on the data and got hooked on the combination of rigorous methods and practical questions with real-world import. Graduate students and colleagues from MIT and from Harvard came out to Busia, where ICS was based, and got involved in the work. A growing team of Kenyans became very skilled at running randomized evaluations, and that high-quality local capacity attracted even more researchers. Eventually, this group of evaluation staff split off from ICS, and IPA Kenya was formed, under the able leadership of Carol Nakesa and Karen Levy. A couple of years later, uh, in 1996, my colleague Abhijit Banerjee asked me to come to India with him to visit an NGO called Seva Mandir to explore running randomized evaluations with them. I remember that trip well, including the point where I didn't realize India was 10 and a half hours rather than 10 hours ahead of, of the US, and I therefore missed my flight to Rajasthan and took a very long, uh, very long drive there. Uh, you, you just heard from Nalima about that visit to Rajasthan and how it spawned a long collaboration between researchers and practitioners evaluating a very wide range of programs. So why did randomized evaluations take off in development economics at this time? Randomized evaluations weren't completely new to economics. Beginning in the 1970s, the US government had launched a number of large-scale studies designed to examine the policy impact of government programs. Shortly after my trip to Kenya, Santiago Levy, working in Mexico's government, put in place a path-breaking evaluation of conditional cash transfer programs that eventually helped lead to the adoption of these programs in 30, or similar programs in 30 countries. The approach that we pioneered in Kenya had several key features that I think were instrumental in allowing randomized evaluations to take off. The large-scale uh, programs that the government, uh, governments had put in place cost millions of dollars and were designed to measure the impact of 
certain very specific programs. When academics collaborated with NGOs, they were able to work much more flexibly on much smaller budgets. There, were, there are many NGOs out there, and the best of them are used to trying out new ideas and working in, a, in, a, in particular areas and then testing things and scaling them up. So the work that we did demonstrated that it was possible for even a new junior, junior faculty member or even a graduate student to put together a randomized evaluation. That had a huge demonstration effect. We also built organizations to conduct trials. And at first, this occurred within ICS, but later, and at much greater scale, in IPA and in JPAL. By building up infrastructure capacity, we were able to try different variants of programs over time and to create an iterative approach of learning that can yield practical innovations capable of scaling. So for example, it was, a whole sequ it was involved in a whole sequence of evaluations of water projects that it enabled estimation of a structural model based on travel costs to get at water valuation. And that eventually led to the development of a new approach to facilitating water treatment that one million people now have access to. This approach, in which academics participated actively in the design of programs, rather than just uh, evaluating programs that, that were set, um, led to deeper insights about society and about human behavior. So there's also a tradition in economics of lab experiments that are designed precisely to test particular economic theories. I feel that trials of the type that were started in Kenya provide a different and, and complementary tool because they force a constructive engagement with the realities of particular real world context, realities that may be that may not be central in the minds of economists, and may not be coming out of our, our theories and models, but that are very important. And recognition of those realities and testing those realities with data can yield its own new modeling efforts. So for example, the first evaluation I conducted of an NGO child sponsorship program wound up unexpectedly yielding broader insights in the political economy of education in Kenya. Another project with Paul Gleve and Sylvie Molan, initially designed to evaluate the impact of textbooks, suggested a fundamental mismatch between Kenya's curriculum and students' existing knowledge levels. Later work in India and in Kenya found that this problem of curriculum mismatch was quite pervasive, and that orienting education systems more towards children's achievement levels could yield substantial gains in learning. In recent work with Pascaline Dupont and Esther Duflo, we modeled that process and draw some con conclusions about the interactions between incentives for teachers and the structure of education. So in addition to helping generate these theoretical insights, building up relationships with NGOs and conducting a series of randomized evaluations made it possible to compare the relative cost effectiveness of different approaches to the same social problem. In many cases, that yielded surprising findings. For example, we looked at a wide variety of ways to increase school attendance and enrollment, and it turned out the most cost-effective approach in our context was treating children for worm infections. The children came to school more, and recent survey work now following these children as adults, so 10 years later, suggested that they were more likely to pass the end of school exam, they worked longer hours later in life, and enough additional hours that the, extra, that the program actually pays for itself through the extra tax revenue that it generates. That raises the question of how we can connect evidence like this that has the potential to dramatically improve people's lives to policy. My own experience from the case of deworming suggests some tentative lessons. While evidence can play a very important role for certain policymakers, it's far from enough on its own. So we met with key policymakers, including Mokhtar Diop, who is who's now the World Bank Vice President for Africa, but at the time was in, in charge of their Kenya program. He was very supportive. Through his help and that of Mike Mills, we met the permanent secretary in the Ministry of Education, presented the results. He's a very sharp guy, immediately got them, wanted to do this. But then, you know, when we next came back to Kenya, it was clear not much was happening. 
And I don't think that was from lack of sincerity. Now, I'm now doing some work in the government myself, I'm starting to appreciate just the crushing pre press of work. Policymakers have thousands of challenges to deal with, from teacher strikes to internal reorganizations. Moving from conceptual agreement about the impact of a small-scale NGO program to an actual designed and implemented government policy requires a huge amount of work. Concept notes have to be put together, timelines and budget created, staffing requirements worked out, people hired, meetings held, documents filed on schedule. That takes a lot of staff, and that takes money. Esther Duflo and I had been named by the World Economic Forum as young global leaders. I, I had more hair then. Um, and that allowed us to help start an NGO, Deworm the World, to raise some money for that purpose we were able to raise funds to second some staff from the NGO to the ministry. As a result of those efforts, very ably led by Karen Levy, Kenya adopted deworming as a national policy. Seeing this, and with the help of JPAL, several Indian states decided that they would follow suit. As a direct result of those efforts, 40 million children are now being treated for worms every year. And those programs are funded overwhelmingly by developing country governments themselves. So there are a number of very exciting stories like this, like that of, of Progressa and Santiago Levy and conditional cash transfers, like deworming, like some of the work that Ben Olkin has done in Indonesia. But academics aren't necessarily the right people to lead these efforts. They don't have the, necess you know, they don't have the incentives. They don't necessarily have the skills. In part to address this institutional gap, I suggested to Raj Shah, the USAID administrator, and to Mara O'Neill, then USAID's chief innovation officer, that USAID tried to help institutionalize support for piloting, rigorously testing, and transitioning to scale the most successful innovations. USAID put together Development Innovation Ventures, which, is a, which helps complement some other approaches and activities that by World Bank and by others were designed to be open across sectors and to focus not just on evaluating programs, but to be supporting innovation and transitioning to scale. We have a budget about, of about $25 million, and we make grants, and, and, uh, and we very much encourage people here to visit the DIB website, and if you have something that's appropriate, to apply. More recently, together with the UK government, and a set of other donors, we're hoping to create a, a new multilateral effort called Global Development Innovation Ventures, which will further expand the available resources. We're in the process of putting this together, and we'd love to hear from those of you who have suggestions on, on how it should work and, and operate. Since Paul LaPaya and I discussed evaluating this child sponsorship program in seven schools, randomized evaluations have, have taken off, and, and with the help of JPAL and other organizations, have had a huge impact on the field of development economics. This approach has radically changed day-to-day -day life for many economists. It's broadened the conception of what economists do, from crunching data and writing models to talking to farmers and inspecting latrines. The knowledge we've learned is helping improve the lives of hundreds of millions of people throughout the developing world. But by putting in place systems to help, systemat to help systematize this process and improve the rate at which the most successful approaches are transitioned to scale, we can institutionalize and accelerate this progress. Thanks.